My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. It's always good to be in God's house. And today we're going to talk about something that will completely change who we are if we'll allow God to do it. We've been in a series uh, about fruit of the Spirit. And every week I talk about, you know, what it takes to develop this fruit and that the fruit is actually the byproduct. The fruit is like being sunburned because you've spent time in the sun. Today we're actually going to start looking at individual fruits, okay? Paul at one point in Galatians says, uh, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and he starts listing them. And we think, oh, I can do that. I can be more peaceful. I can stir up a little bit more kindness. And I want you to understand today, if you get nothing else out of this, that is not what we're talking about. When we prioritize our time with God, we develop roots to the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about pulling the weeds out of our lives, the things that are choking our relationship with Jesus. We can begin looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And, and if you're new, let me tell you about spiritual fruit. Jesus promised, guaranteed, certified, whatever word you want to use. He said that those who trust in Him would receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would begin to change you from the inside out. That you would begin to see things change in your life. And you'd go, how did that happen? I didn't do that. And it just happens. And Paul says those changes are like spiritual fruit. They're supernatural changes. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. And we have said we want more of that in our lives. I, wanna, I want that. God, if you've got it for me, pour it in. And Jesus says, look, here's how this happens. As you abide in me, as you spend time with me, as you turn off the television, as you turn off Facebook, as you turn off your computer and you open the Word of God and you spend time with me, then you will develop fruit in your life. And abide does not mean that you're just going to do your Bible study today. Abide means you're going to meet Jesus in relationship and you are surrendered when you get there. You're not there to tell Jesus what He should do. He doesn't need your opinion. He knew what to do long before you were ever created by Him to have an opinion. It's surrendering. It's what we just sang about. It's getting His perspective and then surrendering to it. Now a critical point that I want you to understand after I fix this. We can't grow spiritual fruit on our own. I keep saying that over and over. And you're going to say, why does He keep saying that? Because we keep trying to do it. Stop trying to do it. You can't make yourself loving and joyful and peaceful the way God is or you would be God. Whatever you try to do in this category is going to fail short. That's why you haven't been able to do it yet. You see, these things are grown only by the Holy Spirit of God. We can act more loving, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about next level love. Throne of God love, Spirit of God love, love from above, love that is impossible for this world to know apart from God. The love we produce on our own is nothing compared to the spiritual fruit of love. Our lives, if surrendered to God, become the garden, the soil that God uses to manifest Himself through us. The only way we can produce true love, joy, peace, patience, kindness is to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, to get ourselves out of the way and let God flow through us moment to moment. He says. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe in your heart that you're a loving person? Do you love people with God's love? You see, we look at love, we look at this first spiritual fruit, and we see all kinds of love around us. We may love our job, we may love our hobbies, we may love our sports teams, we may love our pets, we love people. We sure know how to love ourselves. 
Hopefully we've known to love those and those we love, love us. Sometimes the greatest love we felt is the love for our spouse or for our child. We love our friends and hopefully our friends love us. None of that kind of love is what we're talking about. The spiritual fruit of love is uniquely expressed by those who trust Jesus, those who have the Holy Spirit. You and I love our friends and family. We get it. It's an earthly love. But when we surrender to Jesus, we begin to understand what love really is. You see, I never really understood love until I um, uh, began uh, my love for my children. I mean, that's when it really went deep. I love Tammy. I've loved her for a long time. And I've always loved her, always will. And there's also this love. It's no greater or worse. It just happens for your children. You do anything for them. It's so consuming. It's so selfless that when it's expressed, everybody pays attention. You see, when we do things that only God can do, people stop and take notice. They recognize, oh, wait, wait, that, that kind of love didn't come from here. That kind of forgiveness didn't come from here. That, that's not a love I possess. Where did that come from? Love is the greatest of the spiritual fruits. In Hebrew, the list always starts with the greatest. There are nine spiritual fruits, and they're supernatural, and they come from God. Each of them, when expressed, go far beyond what humans would naturally experience. You may be looking at a few of these, and you may go, you know what, that would be a miracle of God. If so-and-so became more gentle, had more self-control, it'd be a miracle of God if you did it. And those who know you agree with you. That would be a miracle. And that's exactly the point. These are supernatural fruits. They don't come naturally. What we can do naturally doesn't come close to what God can do. You think you, think you know love until you experience God's love. You think you know peace until you have to depend on God's peace to flow through you when there's no other thing to hold on to. When we express God's spiritual fruit, it's obvious to everybody. They see something in you. And they know it's bigger than you. It draws them in. They've seen such a change in your life. I know who they used to be. They didn't love like that. They begin to inquire, what happened to that person? They don't know it, but what they're seeing is Jesus Christ. Now taking residence in you. And God uses us to reveal himself to those around us. Peter and John, two disciples of Jesus. Not really educated, by the way. Not great orators, not great speakers. Yet after Jesus died and was resurrected, they received the Holy Spirit. And they began living by the Spirit. They began preaching boldly for Jesus. And those around them knew. They said, that's Peter and John. Those guys are fishermen. What happened to them? They're like talking spiritually. They're talking about God. They, something's changed. They don't have the power to do what they're doing. Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. That word means freaked out. They recognized they'd been with Jesus. Jesus. And my question for us is, can people look at us and go, whoa, what happened? You must have been with Jesus. That didn't come from here. That didn't come from you. See, we're uneducated. We're common, normal folks here at Remnant. But hopefully we spent so much time with Jesus in the sanctuary, in the quiet place, developing deep roots that when people see us, the one thing they know for sure those might be weird, messed up people, but they've been with Jesus. There's so much of him flowing through them, I can't hardly even see them anymore. Because I'm being bombarded with a love from the throne of God. Why is this so important? Because people are drawn to Jesus. Jesus once talked about his crucifixion and resurrection in John chapter 12. 
And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. What he's saying, look, if you just show people me, I'll do the rest. But the problem is when you and I go out in the world, we show people us. And we act like we're God. God tells, look, stop that. You get out of the way. Let me flow through you. I'll pull people. That's why they call us followers. As the Holy Spirit becomes more prominent in our lives, as we live by the Spirit, Christ is lifted up through us to other people. They get a glimpse of something so supernatural that deep down they realize, I I just saw God. Whatever just happened here wasn't of this world. i got to know more. I've got to chase that. Now, it's interesting that God chose to use us, right? He could have directly revealed himself to people. Have you ever thought about that? He could have just said, you know what? On your 12th birthday, I'm just going to give you a dream. I'm going to come talk to you, tell you who I am, and give you the choice to surrender to me. I'll do it again when you're 18. I'll do it again when you're 26. It's a birthday present. He could have done that. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But yet he chose us. Can I just tell you, so this may be shocking to you. He didn't pick us because we have it together. Okay, so just let that wash over you just for a minute. He didn't pick us because we have it together. He picked us because we're messed up. We are so unable to reflect the things of God on our own that if we do something supernatural, everybody knows it's God. It's not us. We don't have it all together. God is counting on us in many ways to get out of the way and let people go, look, I don't know what just happened, but that wasn't Frank. And I need to know where that came from. Have you thought about the spiritual fruit that got you? Think about that for a minute. You know, with Adam and Eve, we always wonder about the apple. What fruit was it? I wonder when people surrender to Jesus, what fruit was it? What did you finally see in somebody else where you said, I got to have that? Was it authentic love? Maybe somebody loved you who really had no reason to love you. Maybe somebody forgave you when you can't even forgive yourself. Maybe somebody had a peace or a joy and you looked at it and you said, wow, I want that. Maybe it was a kindness that was just so powerful. You just looked at it and you said, I want to live like that. And you began pursuing. For me, the fruit was peace. I saw people in the midst of all kinds of stuff have peace. And I was like, I I don't know what that is, but I want that because I'm an anxious, worrying person and I don't want to do that anymore. And what we see in them is Jesus. If you look at this list, it's a description of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's Jesus. The juiciness of our fruit is the only thing we have to reach a lost world for Christ. Every one of us is here, whether you know it or not, because you saw Jesus manifested in somebody else. Jesus gives us a glimpse. True followers bear fruit. Jesus said there would be a way to determine who are his followers and who aren't. It's easy. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. There are a lot of people who are fans of Jesus. Go, Jesus. Yep. Go, Jesus. They cheer him on. They, they claim to have faith. They, they pick him. If, if, if they're generally positive towards the idea of Jesus. And as long as it doesn't interfere with what they want to do, they'll go to church once in a while when it's convenient. They'll show up when they can. There's nothing more pressing going on. It's raining outside. I, I'll go to church. Just like the Doobie Brothers saying, Jesus is all right with me. It's all right. He's all right. Now that may be all right with us, that is not all right with Jesus. Fans never bear fruit. Jesus doesn't want fans, he wanted followers. Followers spend time with him. Followers go to the sanctuary. Followers accept his perspective and surrender our plans to it. Followers develop deep roots. Followers pull weeds. Followers prioritize him above everything else. We worship him regularly. We prioritize our time together. And Jesus says, you want to know? Look at their fruit. Every week, people seeking fruit 
come through those doors. I get their emails. I hear their stories. I listen to them when they tell me what God's doing in their lives. They finally get to the end of themselves. Their world's falling apart. They're hurting. They're hopeless. They're desperate. And they come to church because nothing else has worked. Everything else they've tried has let them down and somehow led them to this place and that door. Some are just trying to get a glimpse of God to see if he's given up on them. Something that's real. It takes every ounce of courage to walk through that door. Just to walk in our door. They know they don't deserve to be here. What they don't know is neither do we. None of us deserve to be here. All of us have walked through that door hurting, scared, and afraid, and just praying that somehow there's a God who can meet us where we are. They've spent their whole life running. They're worn out, ashamed, often covered in the mess that is their sin. They're the prodigal who finally got to the end of themselves and came to church, tried to come home. They arrive panicked and fearful. Do you know what they're most afraid of? That you'll reject them too. They finally get up the courage to come to a place like this. And their biggest fear is that you'll judge them and reject them. Because that's what they've done to themselves. They've experienced so much pain, so much rejection. They're afraid we're going to reject them. Can you imagine that? They don't know what they're going to do if they come into this place and God's people don't love them. They're looking for something that's been missing their whole life. They're seeking love, real love, God's love, unconditional love, because they know that's the only love they still qualify for. If you knew what I did, you wouldn't love me Oh, but you don't know the unconditional love of Christ. Let me show you. And they come here. And they look for Jesus. Do you know where they're looking? In us. They're looking at us. Do you think they care how well you're dressed? Do you think they care or are moved by how proper you appear in the services? How comfortable you seem with your Christian friends and cliques? how self-righteous you appear at church. The only thing they care about is they're looking at you to see if you're bearing the fruit of Jesus. Because let me just drop another bomb on you. They came here to find Jesus, not you. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. They're not looking at you. They're looking for God in you and me. And we're either bearing his fruit or we're doing nothing. And they can tell the difference. Jesus gives us a glimpse of how he feels when those who should be bearing fruit don't. In the morning, he was returning to the city. He became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And we've talked before about when there's leaves on fig trees, they should be covered in fruit. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again and the fig tree withered. How dare you waste potential? How dare you not produce the fruit that God has put through you? Jesus always, always challenges wasted potential in his believers. Not because he wants to curse us, There's no condemnation for those in Christ. But rather because he knows other people need to see our fruit and we need to abide in him so that we can experience all that he designed us to be. Ask yourself a question. Are you a loving person? We consider ourselves loving people. We love lots of people. We deeply care about others. We serve, we sacrifice, we express our love to them. Just ask my wife, my kids, my family, my friends, my small group. I really do love them. But you know what? 
It doesn't take the power of the Holy Spirit to love people who are lovable. We can naturally, even in our sinful state, show some love to anybody that shows us love in return. We see families, couples, lots of people love people who love them. Nothing really miraculous there, nothing supernatural about that. But the spiritual fruit of love, the love that shouts, God is here, is a love that's not of this world. And it's when you love other people, you know, other people, those people, others, those who don't love you at all, those who hate you, those who tried to hurt you, those who speak and have spoken poorly of you, you know, the real others, the ones you really don't want here. The ones, if they came through that door looking for the fruit of God, you would walk out that door. These are the people you haven't been able to love. Supernatural love shows up when you can't. That moment when your heart breaks, when God opens your eyes, when you see people the way He sees them, when He gives you His perspective on that person. And you begin to feel for them so deeply that there's one thing you're absolutely sure of. The love that you're feeling towards them didn't come from you. Because you want to kill them. You could never love them on your own. Nothing in you could love them. It must be God. So I'll ask you, is God flowing through you to love other people? That friend that betrayed you, your ex-spouse, the young boy who now is the father of your unexpected grandchild, homeless person that you'd prefer not be here, the spouse who violated your marriage vow, the other man or woman who seduced them, the person you're furious at right now, do you have the capacity within you to let God love them through you? What about the obnoxious alcoholic who killed your child while driving drunk? What about the drug dealer who tempts somebody you love? The men who are involved in sex trafficking? The child predator who just moved into the neighborhood and tried to reach your child? The adult who molested you years ago? The man who raped you? The people who disagree with you? The people who perform abortions? Those who shake their fists at God, believers who have hurt and disappointed you, do you love them? Do you allow God's love to flow through you to them? Do you have the capacity to love them? No way. Not a chance. You might say to show that kind of love to those kind of people would take a miracle of God. It would take a miracle. I don't have it in me. It was going to happen. If it's going to happen, God has to do it. Exactly. If it's going to happen, God has to do it. And now we're beginning to understand the spiritual fruit of love. It's not natural to us. No human could possibly love them. There's no reason I should love them. It must be God. Jesus said it this way. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. I want to explore this kind of love. If you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. It's called the love chapter. In the preceding chapter, Paul has talked to the Corinthians. Now remember, Corinthians, the church on gone wild, Corinth. It was Las Vegas of the time. He's talking to the Corinthians who were craving to perform miracles, to have gifts, to show off what they have. And he tells them, look, instead of, instead of chasing spiritual gifts, you should be pursuing the greatest gift, which is love. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned and don't have love, I gain nothing. Compared to love, supernatural gifts don't impress God. Growing in faith without love doesn't impress God. Generous giving without love doesn't move God's heart. And then Paul tells us what love should look like. Love is patient and kind. Does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. Does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. You see the flowers in that verse? Love is patient. It's kind. Rejoices with truth. Do you see the weeds? Does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant, not rude. Doesn't insist on its own way, is not resentful. Does not rejoice at wrongdoing. You see, in our own, when people we don't like or when people it's hard for us to love get punished or things go bad inside, we're like, yes! Love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. These weeds are barriers to love. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to pull these weeds out of our garden so we can express His love. These weeds are the reason we don't love the way Christ loved. Love is patient. We need God to pull impatience out of our garden. Love does not envy. We need jealousy pulled out of our garden. Love does not insist on its own way. We need selfishness pulled out of our garden. But the chilling truth we spoke of last week is that you and I don't have time to pull weeds. There's no spiritual roundup that we can spray to kill the weeds in our lives. Only Jesus can pull those weeds. Jesus is a great weed puller. In John 4... Jesus helped pull the weeds for a Samaritan woman who had an encounter with her where he removed the weeds of loneliness and empty love and showed her God's love. In Mark chapter 1, he helped pull the weeds of a leper and helped him overcome the weeds of isolation and shame and restored his hope and faith by showing him God's love. In Luke chapter 9, he pulled some weeds for Zacchaeus He removed the weeds of greed and selfishness in order to show them God's love. In John 8, he pulled a woman caught in adultery and removed the the weeds of lust and shame and replaced them with the flowers of forgiveness and hope and God's love. Jesus helped people pull weeds. He freed people from these weeds that were entangling them and keeping them from growing. He looked beyond the weeds to see the person rather than just their problem. Do you focus on the person or the problem? You see, when we take the time to know somebody, when we sit down in the cafe and we know people by name, and we share our stories and we find out that we're all alike, when we take time to connect with them or with your coworker or anybody in your life, you discover always that the weed that is entangling them came from a wound. And God plans to heal the wound with his love. In the process, he transforms us. You see, we have this ability to focus on the weed and miss the wound. Supernatural love walks right through the weed, goes straight to the root, sees the person, and heals their wound. You see, if you dig around deep enough in the dirt of someone's life, you find a wound. And that wound is the root that grows the problems they have in their life. You can be like me as a 12-year-old and just destroy what you see, but the wound's still there. Last week I spoke about pulling weeds, how we had to remove everything, the weed, the stem, and most importantly, the root. Where do you think getting to the root of the problem came from? 
we got to get to the root of the problem. Those who don't love others with God's love only see the weeds because they're only willing to go surface level. They look at somebody's life and they go, oh, you're homeless. You're a drug addict. You're arrogant. You're whatever. We see the weed. But we know that with God's love pouring through us, under every weed is a wound. Man's love stays on the surface. God's love goes deep and heals wounds. How do you feel about Hugh Hefner? Think much about Hugh Hefner? He's dead now. He's got a star on the Walk of Fame. Karen Koval was a Christian TV producer who worked in Hollywood. She was producer of Legends and Headliners with Matt Lauer. Her first assignment was to plan and produce an interview with Hugh Hefner. She was seriously conflicted. She wanted to walk away from it. She's a Christian woman. But she went to the sanctuary and she asked God for his opinion, for his perspective. And God prompted her to find the deeper story, to love him as only God can love him. She was led by her team to discover Hugh Hefner and who he was, and not to just focus on the obvious, the weed of his life. Like every other interview he had done, the the interview proceeded with simple yet unexpected questions. What were your parents like? What characterized your childhood? What childhood experiences shaped you? And the crew was shocked as Hugh began pouring out details. He'd been raised in a Puritan home, strict and deep religious tradition. His parents believed in God, but not a God of grace, not a God of compassion, not a God of love. They had a very rigid, judgmental religion. They never expressed any love for him, he said. They never told Hugh or his brother that they loved him. His mother was a germaphobe, never kissed him or showed him any affection. Hugh said he set out to find love wherever he could find it. He began to weep as he shared the story of the blanket his parents gave him for security. He painted a very vivid picture of going to bed at night holding that blanket. It was bordered with bunnies. It became his comfort blanket and the inspiration for his empire. He also revealed growing up that he always wanted a puppy. His mother said the dog spread too many germs. Hugh developed a tumor in his ear and his parents gave in and they bought him a puppy. His parents hated the puppy. Miraculously, five days later, the puppy just died. And the crew was spellbound as Hugh described his parents wrapping that puppy in his blanket and burying it. At this point in the interview, Hugh said this, I guess I'm just a little boy trying to find love. Karen Covell realized in that moment God had used her to expose the gaping hole in this man's life. You see, big weeds have big roots. Big roots come from big wounds. This man had confused sex for love turned a desperate need into an empire of pornography, and despite all his wealth, all his fame, all the women, all the notoriety, he closed the interview by telling them that he's still searching for the love he never had. How do you feel about Hugh Hefner? You see, sometimes when we move past the weeds and we see the wounds, God begins to move our heart. We begin to say things like, there but by the grace of God go I. You see, often we judge people by the weeds in their life. But God's love, God's supernatural fruit of love of the Spirit, searches for wounds. Wounds that will keep growing if they're never addressed. Hugh Hefner was not the only person looking for love in all the wrong places. Day in and day out, we're surrounded by people who need to experience the love of Jesus with no strings attached. They need to experience the fruit of love, God's love. They come here looking for it, and they look for it in us. We don't judge their weeds because we know they can't pull them. We don't have the power to pull the weeds and grow fruit, so don't miss this. Neither do they. 
They can't fix the problems they come in here with. The weed in their life, the root of hurt. If they could, they would have done it. They're trying to drown it. They're trying to cover it. They're trying to clean it up. They're trying to numb it. Every weed has a wound at its base. And God calls us into the dirt. We have to love them enough to point them to Jesus. Because we trust Jesus to take care of that wound. To pull up that root. To to grow fruit in them like he did for us. Our job is just to keep pouring love out. Serving others. Meeting their needs. Taking the time to know who they really are. Caring about them with no strings attached. Treating them the same whether they slept on a mansion in Longboat Key or whether they slept on Longboat Key. Whether their last drink was a glass of wine from their patio overlooking the bay or a bottle of wine from a brown bag overlooking a dumpster, it doesn't matter. Paul tells us what true love looks like when it's mature. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Do you see what's repeated in this verse? Remember, repeating something in Scripture is a Hebrew way of highlighting it, making it bold, capping it, and underlining it. All things. All things. Love bears all things. Name something. God's love bears that. Believes all things. Name something. God's love believes in all things, hopes all things, endures all things. All things. There's nothing you can think of, say, or do that he doesn't cover with his love. All people. No matter what person God has placed in your path to love, when everything in you says no, Love bears all, believes all, hopes all, and endures all, no exceptions. Name something that hurt you. Name somebody that hurt you. God's love bears and endures that. Name something else. God's love bears and endures that. Keep going. God's love bears, hopes, endures, believes everything. There's nothing you can bring to God that his love doesn't cover. No wound you can bring to God that his love doesn't heal. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, there's everything again, above all, loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That's what love does. Love covers a multitude of sin. As we love people, the love of Jesus pours through us and we begin to root out weeds. The weeds of sin and shame that people are entangled in. And then we get down to the roots and we go, you know what? I know what to do for the wound. Let me show you Jesus. He can heal your wound so that weed will never grow again. And then someone comes along who trusts, who instills hope. Someone who through the eyes of Jesus still sees the potential in every person even though they themselves have lost their own belief in their own potential. Paul says that love endures all things. God's love persists when all other love is given up. God's love keeps you in your marriage when everything shouts to leave. God's love keeps you from giving up on your child when everybody else has. God's love pushes you through the smell and the guarded resistance to see the person living in the emptiness of homelessness, desperate for God's love. God's love pushes you past the iron gate, the mansion, the riches, to see the person with the wound, living in the emptiness of materialism and desperate for God's love. God's love and only God's love pushes you past your hurt to love the people who've hurt you. Through us, God wants us to love those that we've deemed unlovable. God's love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. 
For he who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God who he's not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. Notice it's a commandment. It's a commandment. If you love God, you have to love other people. And if you abide with Christ, you'll want to love other people. That's what changes. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, there it is, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. When people see God's love flowing through you, the one thing they know is it ain't you, it's God. We call ourselves the church of Jesus Christ. It's ridiculous for us to claim to be the church of Jesus Christ and not love the underserving and other people the way Jesus did. Somebody asked me recently, what do you hope people see when they come in your church? I said, Jesus. I hope we're the kind of church that does what Jesus would do. Because we're saying we're following him. We never give up on anybody. When others give up, he got busy. He hated the sin, but oh, how he loved the sinner. As Christians, how dare we bear the name of Christ if we can't love like Jesus loved? If we've already decided who's worthy to sit in these seats and share our orange carpet. If we decide that there's a gatekeeper at the altar to decide who's worthy to be down here on their knees. There's a reason why love is the first fruit listed. It's listed because it's the distinctive character that defines those who follow Jesus. It's what sets us apart from everybody else. If you have the supernatural spiritual fruit of love in your life, if you love those that the world has said is unlovable, if you have the perspective when others don't and you persevere through anything, you push past their resistance with love, not judgment. When you see weeds in the lives of others, you don't destroy the weed, you pray that God will show you the wound. Second week of this series, I talked about gaining God's perspective. When you try to love people at a surface level and just wipe out the weed, you usually wipe out the person. What you and I need to be doing is saying, God, I see the weed, show me the wound. Because I didn't come here to deal with weeds, I came here to deal with wounds. Because I have the supernatural power of Jesus Christ flowing through me, and there are hurting people who need to feel his love. Show me the wound. You begin to see God's plan to transform people because he loves them too much to leave them where they are. That's why he sent you there. That's why you're in the life of somebody. When somebody comes up to you and they're hurting, they're there because God's presenting them to you. And you begin to see with his eyes and his perspective and you begin to understand the potential that he put in every human being on the planet. And through the process, without realizing it, he transforms you and I too. You see, God wants to bring out our potential too. This isn't just about the people we're helping. He changes us. Because he loves you and I too much to leave us where we are. Let me close with this last verse of this chapter. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest is love. Why is love better than faith and hope? You ever thought about that? Because faith and hope will one day go away. When Christ returns or when you and I go to heaven, we don't have faith anymore. We have certainty. Faith is that which is not seen. When we get to heaven, we have no doubt Jesus is very real, very alive, and very much our Savior. We don't need faith for that. It's right in front of us. We've got certainty. Faith is being sure of what you've not seen. You've seen Jesus face to face. When you get to heaven, what are you going to hope for? You have it all. Everything you've ever hoped for is already there. Faith and hope go away. Love doesn't. We sing it all the time. His love endures forever. Love will be all over the place in heaven. That's what we're going to live on. So when you look over those that Jesus loves, those he died for, let me ask you this penetrating question. 
You see weeds or wounds? Who has God placed in your life? Because he wants you to see wounds and all you've been looking at is the weed. Who is God bringing to your mind right now? And inviting you into the dirt with them to pour out his love on their weeds, wounds. Who have you been unwilling to love? Who's too messy for you to love? Who's too risky for you to love? Honestly, who would you prefer didn't walk through that door to our services? Who have you decided is not worthy to be here? Are there any weeds that entangle you that keep you from loving people that you see? Do you see them as a problem or a person? Ask God to show you their wound. And then ask him to give you the courage to cover it with your love, his love. Jesus wants his followers going out into the wound with the miracle that is his love and healing all wounds. That his people all over the world would meet people in the midst of their pain and their wound and say, let me show you God's love. We're going to change you from the inside out. Let me take you back to where we started. Do you believe in your heart that you're a loving person? Do you love people with God's love? God has placed people in our lives with wounds that need to be healed, and he's equipped you and I and positioned us to be there. I want you to challenge you this week. Ask God who he wants you to love. Ask him for an opportunity to love someone that nobody loves, that everybody else has given up on. And then let him know, here I am, Lord, send me. I've got so much of your love, I can't wait to pour it out. Show me some wounds, God. I want to share with you in the wound healing business. You've never locked eyes with anyone that Jesus does not want you to love. Pray that Jesus will remove any weed, any self-righteousness, any arrogance, anything that keeps you from being willing to love anyone, including unforgiveness. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, and then he put the zinger at the end, just as I have loved you. No less, just as I have loved you, in the same manner, just as, exactly the way I love, in the same depth, the same determination, the same grace, the same mercy, the same compassion, the same forgiveness, the same heart. Jesus said, you go love people like I loved you just like I loved you. Let's pray. God, we have a world desperate for love. We have people with really serious wounds. Many of us are still accepting your love to heal our wounds. God, we're all in process. None of us have this figured out. We're all messed up. But you've put your love in us. God, move our heart. Take away any obstacle, any barrier, any right to be right that keeps us from loving the person you told us to love, which is everybody. Help us to be the church, God, that loves hard, that loves everybody who walks through the door. Help us to be the church that focuses on wounds and not weeds. Help us to be the church that looks like Jesus, acts like Jesus, loves like Jesus, because we're following Jesus. And help us, God, to abide in your word so that your fruit can flow through us because the world desperately needs to see you and not us. We love you. We thank you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 